its intentions were good, but it did not understand its job. It desired, however, to rule with popular consent and prepared for a general election. In the meantime, the Russian Soviet idea was spreading. In Berlin, there were bloody street fights, and for a time, it appeared likely that the German people would embrace communism after the Russian model. When Eisner opened the National Assembly, he found himself without a seat, and the Assembly in a state of turmoil. The workers, farmers, and soldiers' council objected to the election and decided to rule by means of their own Congress. Eisner and some of his ministers were shot. The council took matters into their own hands and prepared for a dictatorship of the proletariat. In the month of March, the Central Council declared through its president, Dr. Neuroth, an Austrian economist, that the socialization of everything in Bavaria would start without delay. The compulsion and oppression of capitalism was to be replaced by new forms of the old evil. State regulation by edicts, police, and bureaus was the only plan in sight. Once again, public opinion began to veer towards an elective National Assembly, and in April 1919, the General Council declared that it would forcibly prevent the meeting of the Assembly. The trend towards revolution and communism was for a time stimulated by external events. Bela Kuhn had proclaimed a Hungarian Soviet. The Red Armies of Russia had conquered the Ukraine and general strikes were sweeping all the industrial centers of Middle Europe, all due to inflation and a breakdown of the price level. Nikish delivered an inflammatory speech at Augsburg, which aroused the people to demand the dissolution of the National Assembly under Hoffman and the proclamation of the Soviet Republic of Bavaria. It was at the meeting of the Central Council, where this action was taken on April 6th and 7th, 1919, that consideration was given to the important question of finance. While out of office, the socialists had refused to admit that there was a finance problem. As soon as they assumed the responsibilities of office, it was the first problem to confront them for immediate action. Not a single member of the council had prepared himself for the office. Not one was willing to undertake duties of which he was completely ignorant. Fortunately, Nikish had read some of the writings of Silvio Gazelle, and what was still more fortunate, he found in Landauer, who was a disciple of Proudhon, 
a warm supporter. They presented his name for the post nobody else wanted, and the motion carried. Silvio Gazelle accepted the call and became the Minister of Finance in a Soviet government whose philosophy and economic program he did not accept. The credit for thus providing Gazelle with what then appeared to be a splendid opportunity of demonstrating his ideas must be shared by Dr. Christen, physician, physicist, and mathematician at Bern University. Dr. Christen had made the acquaintance of Gazelle in 1916 when the latter delivered his famous lectures on war and peace. The brilliant scientist and great humanitarian, was deeply impressed by Gazelle's message on the cause of national and international unrest and war. His admiration for Gazelle was intensified when, at a Swiss single tax meeting, a difficult social problem was discussed and Gazelle's arguments and proposals found enthusiastic response and seemed to reveal the simple and straight road from ruin to reconstruction. Dr. Christen then began to read everything Gazelle had published. He kept at it day and night. The complexity of economic distress which, as a physician, he had faced day by day. He found here clearly analyzed, its factors formulated, and the problem solved. In 1916, Dr. Christen was made director of the Institute for Ray Exploration at Munich. There he found time to put some of Gazelle's teachings into mathematical formula and to submit to the Swiss and German governments practical proposals for the use of these formula in finance. The proposals were disregarded. In January 1919, Gazelle had gone to Berlin in order to prepare the third edition of his epochal work, The Natural Economic Order. On his way back to Switzerland, he stopped at Munich to visit his friend, Dr. Christen. There he learned for the first time that he had been proposed for the office of Minister of Finance. The question is often asked, how could Gazelle, the champion of individualism, of private enterprise, associate with a socialistic government? The answer is, they had called him to realize his work. What could the political frame matter within which this world-important act was to be performed. Gazelle deemed it his highest duty to seize the opportunity of applying his teachings, whatever the sacrifices were and however daring the enterprise might appear. Thus, he accepted the call and began his work. He was fully conscious of the tremendous difficulties before him, but he tackled his task with the energy and courage of one who knows exactly what he has to do. First, he sought to enlighten the people by official manifestos 
on the measures contemplated. He worked out a plan of action and a plan to balance the budget.